Welcome to another episode of The Job is Easy, The People Are Not. Today, I have the immense pleasure to introduce to you one of the most favorite people in the world, uh, Professor Roberto Fernandez from MIT Sloan. Um, I've met Roberto about 10 years ago in 2011, 2012, when I experienced being at MIT for the first time as an observer in his classroom. And my eyes and my heart filled up with so much joy and excitement, but also I was in awe of how he was teaching a group of very, very senior leaders. Majority of the people in the room were CEOs. And he enthralled the whole room with his energy, with his positivity, with his sense of humor, with his capacity to manage the emotions in the room. And I always thought of him as, a, as an orchestra director, that you can see how he takes the energy of a large group of people and he lifts them up. He takes them down when they are too high. He engages them. He makes them feel validated. He makes them feel emotionally connected. And I think more than anything, he is extraordinary because he cares and he shows how much he cares. So Roberto Fernandez was also very, very influential, influenced, influential in my PhD thesis when I first wrote about developing multiple perspectives and I learned about the three lenses of developing multiple perspectives. And I was very tempted to ask him to talk about the multiple perspectives. Um, and he's a scholar of multiple perspectives. But I thought of him as the human behind um, behind the, 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 the teaching uniform, if you want, not that we have any. And I thought he is one of the most emotionally mature, emotionally sensitive, emotionally intelligent people that I know. And I invited him to be on this on this. Um, project, the job is easy, the people are not, to talk to us about emotional maturity. Without further ado, Professor Roberto Fernandez calling all the way from Boston at MIT Sloan. So I do uh, enjoy um, learning and I really um, found the sm smart and sharp mm -hmm. framework um, very insightful. Thank you. I, I think that it's it's um, it's you know it, in that it covers a, a broad waterfront, yeah, and and has a way of thinking about um, what are you know often thought of as a kind of basket of skills, mm -hmm. but you know it, it finds the commonality um, with respect to emotional maturity specifically. Yeah, I started reflecting on. You know, how do I think about this? Of course, I'm flattered that you have, you know, chosen me as an example. Uh, I would suggest that you check in with my wife before you conclude. That <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually accurate, um, but that, that's neither here nor there, right? Um, I would, I would say, just one, a couple of thoughts, um, and again, we can we can get started, but I want to make yeah. sure we're sort of on the same page. Mm -hmm. So. So my reflections on this, as after you've invited me to do this, is um, rather than emotional maturity, the aspect that I would focus on is emotional sensitivity. Mm. And there is where you connect most closely to EQ yeah. and Daniel Goldman, right? that um, there is a fact that people vary in the degree to which they can, or, or even care to, um, be sensitive to the emotions and feelings of others, right? Um, why this matters is that uh, we're not just thinking machines, we're feeling machines. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so that's the first the first insight was um, sensitivity because, you know, it has this, to say maturity makes it sound like, okay, it's something you grow out of. It may in fact be, I, I, I'm a true believer in development. Um, and so it may in fact be that people, when it's called to their attention, they can actually work on this and be more attuned, right? 
uh, one of the things that in our busy lives that can often get, um, you know, the urgent can push out the essential yep. of actually being in tune with people. So, so I, I, I think sensitivity may be a, uh, yeah. a way to think about this. The other, the other um, aspect that I think was, I've been reflecting about how I've, how I have been uh, teaching this material um, over the years. Mm. And so I think you've picked up on, you know, something that, yes, I care quite a bit about, which is that, as you know, I have a frame framework, which is essentially thinking fast and slow yep. that I share with anyone who listen. Right. But I quickly um, remind people that actually it's missing something. And that it's not just thinking fast and slow, it's also feeling. So uh, I don't know if you remember, but I talk about two columns, right? The column, the left column being the equivalent of thinking fast and slow. This is, this is a framework uh, from my uh, colleagues who've written a paper about this, Drajan Prelik being my colleague at MIT, but Colin Kammerer, and it's actually three authors. And it's a way of organizing the research around uh, neuro... Um, neuroeconomics, I guess, is in the title. So uh, that's how they think about it. Um, but why should we care about brain science? Well, okay. So the the um, the first column is the cognitive column. It's about thinking, mm -hmm. and there it's exactly you know exactly what's been um, well understood in uh, Dan Kahneman and. Um, thinking fast and slow. And there's lots of insights there, you know, that which is slow becomes fast. That's expertise. There are all kinds of uh, implications of that, especially in safety situations. Often what you're trying to do is to slow down so that you're not cutting corners. Yeah. Um, and and uh, there's also, you know, stereotypes uh, often are exactly this kind of process. What has, um, what has uh, led me to prefer not just take, talking about thinking fast and slow, but to also add this feeling fast and slow, which is the right column, that there's a parallel fast and slow process, which is around emotions. Right? I love that. And, right. And the reason I, 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 I think for two reasons, one is that I actually think we may misconstrue what look like thinking biases mm -hmm. um, as actually there's an emotional component. Yeah. Right. So for example, sunk costs, right? Of course. Pride, pride and not wanting, you know, sunk costs is one of the classic, you know, shortcuts. Yep. Uh, shortcuts. But is it because people don't want to admit that they've been on the wrong track? Right. And that, really does kind of may have a be coming from a different source, right? Which yeah. is this kind of pride, right? And often yeah. pride, pride is what needs to be overcome. Yep. If you if you think about the, you know, the suggestions you have for overcoming uh, something like some costs, it's exactly step back and put yourself in the position of say you know shareholders what would they do if you know you know would they accept your story <laughs> right uh where you know and that's in fact uh, i i think fundamentally perhaps an emotional process so there's so i think there's a conflation that can happen if you don't mm -hmm. if you're not kind of thinking about the that part and i also i also reflect on the um you know, the reality that for many of us in, in organizational situations, um, very important features of relationships like trust have a deeply emotional component, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And, so, and so to be in a situation where you're, you're saying, you know, let's, let's think about the the shortcuts, but remember those those um, parallel processes can mm -hmm. be quite quite consequential. Um, and I, I often 
In fact, I'm thinking about teaching this tomorrow. Um, I've, I've resurrected something. I, I used to teach as uh, part of my motivation for paying attention to these things, um, statements by two CEOs. And one CEO would say, you know, the question that, that was um, the interviewer was prompting was, what, you know, uh, what do you do when, when you get angry at work? Or when was the last time you got angry at work? And the first CEO says, I don't get angry. I get frustrated, you mm-hmm. know, and, um, and basically went on to describe how um, I get frustrated when we were doing a merger and people were hemming and hawing and I don't know, I don't know. Right. And he realized that a lot of this had to do with a feeling of buy-in. Of course. But they just hadn't bought in. They hadn't owned the merger. And so, he, he had the ability to be clear about, okay, this is an emotional ownership issue. Mm. And he was able to crystallize it as, okay, sign up or sign out. Okay. So he was comfortable enough to see what was going on here. Right? Mm-hmm. And again, buy-in is one of those emotional, has an emotional component, right? If it's yours, you, you, you see it better, right? The other CEO, um, uh, told the story about when was the last time uh, this morning at 7 a.m. <laughs> and uh, that he was very rude to one of his reports. And he stepped back and he thought about it and he realized that that wasn't fair. And that as I stepped back and thought about it, I realized he'd had a pretty good idea. Mm. And so what I did about it was I called them and I apologized. And I told them that I thought that was a pretty good idea. Right? So this is a person, now I don't know if that's emotional maturity, uh, but this is a person who certainly is in touch with their own emotions. Mm-hmm. Like that was not helpful. My first reaction at 7 a.m. was not helpful. In fact, counterproductive. Yep. And displayed something that you don't see very often which is um, a CEO who is willing to say, I made a mistake, a CEO who apologizes. And to recognize that perhaps the shields up, which is his first response, was more emotional about it not being his or coming, you know, being new or whatever it was. And then he, again, slowed down upon reflection and, um, so, so just as, again, feeling, his first feelings were not the best, right? But he was in touch with them and realized that actually, um, you know, slowing down upon further reflection, listening, uh, listening that, was, um, that was actually a very important feature. So those were my key reflections uh, mm-hmm. as I thought about this um, the skill, really, it's a skill that you're skill, talking yeah. about cultivating. Yeah. And, um, and whether, whether it's described as maturity because it's some advanced level of accomplishment, okay, maybe that's fine. But certainly um, sensitivity mm-hmm. would be the, the thing you're looking for. Yeah. And that's crucial in any relating. Absolutely. And so in, as an as a, as a organizational skill, that's important. And I think it aligns with what we know about the human animal, which is that we we have these emotional uh, reactions. And and when and and we love, for example, the example I often teach with, you may have even heard me make these kinds of claims, uh, be present when I say them, which is we love passion. Yep. When we agree with the person. Exactly. (laughs) But when we disagree with that the side. <laughs> right, when we disagree with the person, they're irrational. Yep. I hear and that so, all the time. Right. And so I've had CEOs say, we ask people to check their emotions at the door. Mm-hmm. And I then quip with them, well, then you have asked them to decapitate themselves. Yep. Right? And then I say, You love passion, don't you? When you agree. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So here's here's the you know the yin and the yang, right? Which is that you know there's there is a um, discomfort, and by the way, no doubt some of this is cultural, right? It, there are cultural yeah. um, settings. A lot of it is too. Yeah, yeah, no, but but there there, and I think probably the variation within culture is probably almost as wide as the variation between. So yeah. please don't let me think about this as cultural stereotypes and. Uh, but but I do think actually what is what is considered acceptable, uh, or how emotional displays are acceptable, really does vary. There's actually very good research on smiling, for example. Mm-hmm. Right? Turns out smiling um, is um, in in uh, certain places. It's actually seen. We think, oh, it's 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 a it's a sign of intimacy in the West. Often we think of it as a sign of intimacy, etc. Uh, good research shows that actually in societies where the institutions aren't strong, when someone's smiling, actually you made nervous. Yep. Like, are they going to take advantage of me? Right? Or you're being disrespectful. Or And, and in the case of, uh, there, there's, um, you know, these are anecdotes, but I think useful anecdotes. When um, the Olympics were coming to Russia, McDonald's had to engage in training for their workers to teach them how to smile because these Westerners were going to come. And that's not a default setting for Russians. There's an, there's an expression that, you know, uh, laughing for no reason is a, um, is a sign of stupidity. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a very, you know, very, very um, controlled yeah. displays of smiling. And there are, uh, there are examples where there are these, you know, uh, an, uh, a Brit was crossing, was so happy crossing one of the bridges in St. Petersburg and was looking up and down and was smiling and was happy. And this policeman arrested her because she was acting very strange. Just <laughs> this happens um, in my culture, too, by the way. I'm, I'm Romanian and this happens in my culture, too. When I moved from U.S., uh, to Malaysia, I would spend a little bit of time in Romania, and my colleagues would tell me all the time, "You're so American. You're smiling all the time." <laughs> and smile, smiles do have, you know, th- there are rules around these emotional displays, and it would. But and again, I, I don't want to overplay this, right? Because th- yeah. probably the the variation within, say, the United States, um, in what those rules are is probably almost as great as any you know, mm. global variation that we see. Um, but, but there is something to this. And smiles in particular, actually, are actually contagious. Yes. Right? right? And, emotions, and emotions in general, I think, are contagious. Are con- and, and, that, and so when we talk about an aspect of organizational culture, we have those, you know, Places where the meetings are held, where everyone has a furrowed brow, <laughs> and a furrowed brow, and you know, and we're so tough and whatever, right? And then there are meetings where it's lighter, it feels better, mm-hmm. right? Um, and there's a, a more free flowing, right? And you start to realize that relaxing and uh, be creativity, for example, right, can be helpful. Now, let me be clear. Let me be clear. Um, that is uh, sounds like a normative statement. <laughs> right? um, it really depends on you know whether the 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 system you're set up is one where actually you're able to have respectful disagreements. Mm-hmm. Right? If you can be in a meeting and still have fun and disagree, uh, you know, vehemently with each other, right? That's a very different tone. Yep. Then a meeting where, you know, people are thinking about how to drive stakes through each other's hearts or, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, I know you're Romanian. You would you would know about driving stakes. <laughs> <laughs> Not recently, but yes. See, this is this is the primary reason why I started this project, because when I when I first started this job at Asia School of Business, my previous boss when I told her that I'm really worried that I don't have the right credentials to be to be joining this company, this, this school, she said, oh, don't worry, Loredana, the job is easy. The people are not. 
And that's why the title of this, this book, this podcast, this, this video series is called The Job is Easy, The People Are Not. And then I realized as I moved from being just a professor of management to a practitioner of management, that I deal with a lot more issues coming out of the smart skills than the sharp skills. I really thought in the beginning that I'm not qualified because I actually don't know enough finance. I don't know enough technology. I don't know enough IT. I don't know enough marketing, science, data analytics, etc. And it turns out what I didn't know, I didn't know how to be really smart to understand people. I, I realized that the majority of the work conflict that some of my executive education clients or students report comes from the space of you know, um, emotional, the, 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 the un, um, unacceptable emotional display relative to that culture of a group or a community or a company mm-hmm. that, uh, uh, like you said, the example of the two CEOs is not just the CEO that's going to lose it. In, mon- in many situations, actually colleagues, peers, you know, subordinate. So I want you to better understand how does emotions play a role in, in becoming, if you want, smart in developing this 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 skills because people don't complain that much about the printer not working as they complain about the colleague who's not listening or who's emotionally abusive or who's emotionally immature you hear people saying all the time you act as a child and that caused me to think about how emotional maturity is important for for somebody in a professional setting because it requires a higher level of control of your emotions a higher level of recognition on other people's emotions so I, I agree thoroughly with that. I, I uh, as long as I, I, I love your um, the adage that you've chosen to frame uh, all of this series around. Uh, but but there's an old engineering saying that I learned when I first arrived at MIT, which I think you may also uh, want to adapt in some way, uh, fold it into your work, which yes. is be hard on the problems. Mm-hmm. But soft on the people. Yep, I heard that before. Right. It's really very good, right? right. It's, yeah, be hard on the problem, be soft on the people. And sometimes the people are bringing you the problem, mm-hmm. right? So can't we work in a hard way on that problem? Yes. Right, in a sharp way, and you, using your language, right? Uh, but let's be smart about how we're enlisting people to do that, not, you know, Killing messengers and um, mm-hmm. you know exactly. be, being being these bad overreactions. The first reaction that the second CEO had, right, which was hmm, kill that messenger. You know, but at they least brought me something case, like you said, he realized. There's there's a lot of us I think that probably have similar reactions. We realize it, but I don't think we have enough maturity to call back the person and say I apologize. I don't think we have enough humility which is also a smart skill that I, I preach a lot because I realized for me, even though I don't, I don't come off as very humble, I actually, I think, come off borderline arrogant. It's just because I think of myself as a confident person. But I think for me, humility is knowing what you don't know, is realizing when you didn't do something well and, and pulling it back. And I think confidence and humility are actually very, very close. I agree. Uh, I agree. I agree. The, 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 um, you said it nicely, knowing what you don't know. And and, and I think an, another key component about why is it so important to invest in these smart skills is because it aids your learning. Um, you, it's very hard to learn. Yes. If you're not attuned to the environment in which you're working, or if you have a sense that, oh, either I had it right. And, and this is a trap that I think some CEOs get into, right? Mm-hmm. which is that they're expected to have the answer rather than to set set the um, the circumstances in the company so that the answers are explored so that we can actually learn from those and that no one person is smart in in the way that is exclusive yeah. beyond everyone else right so harnessing learning and being able to actually um, get teams moving in the right direction. These are these are really very um, um, consistent with this emphasis that you've developed in this framework. 
about smart yeah. skills. And, and once again, for me, it comes back to, to the fact that a lot of the professional issues that we encounter um, come from the space of smart skills, come from the space of emotions, come from the space of the need for validation, come from the space of lack or presence of humility. And I, um, I really feel that we, one of the reasons why I want to propose this framework is I feel like we are also moving away from a very, um, from a generation that accepted very authoritative leadership um, almost as a given. And I think the I think the transformation in the workplace that millennials brought, that the Gen Z is bringing, is going to require a lot more humane leadership. I don't know if I can call it that. I'm not a leadership expert, but I I, I think I wanted to bring more justice to the words because I don't think that soft represents anymore the way we interpret the value of the skills. The, the same way I don't think that hard represents it anymore because. You need to constantly adapt them, sharpen them. Um, you work with a lot of CEOs and you work with a lot of executive uh, senior leaders in, in, in your programs. Is this part of a conversation or is it mostly, you know, let's talk about the PNL and KPIs? So um, if, if they're talking to me, it's not about KPL. Uh, 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 sorry, um, KPIs. KPIs and, PNL, yes. And, um, no. If... Almost always, I'm engaged in a transformation journey of some kind. Mm -hmm. And the wise CEOs are saying, hmm, it's a mindset shift that we need, isn't it? Yeah. And that is uh, perhaps a display of that kind of smart skill that you are you're, um, asking about, mm -hmm. um, which is that the, the kind of distance where I've been perfectly clear, we have a roadmap, we have sent it an email to everyone, now go execute. Those are underpowered changes. And yeah. often, often these CEOs get there after a few false starts, right? Where they've tried <laughs> to be in the express lane, right? Very, very, and then they realize we need to back up. We need to think about sharing the ownership. Yep. Um, we need to think about the value of meaning, right? That why, what's, you know, if it's so clear to me, yeah. uh, what is it that is missing? Why, what, what is it they don't get? Well, it's not they that's not getting it, right? It's that the case has not been made apparently, right? Okay. And I think, I think that's a, a large part of the, um, when, when you refer to the, you know, the, the Gen X and, you know, the various generational shifts that have occurred over the years, I think there is, uh, it, you know, right now there's a um, a great reassessment going on with many mm -hmm. people with their careers, right? And a lot of it is realizing, like, what is all this for? Yes. Right. And and um, and I think that that reassessment um, is a kind of awakening uh, of drawing a breath. One thing COVID has done is had people draw a breath and realize, well. What is, you know, do we work to live or? Yeah, what's the purpose work? of what you're doing? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And I think that um, the, that once you recognize it is, um, oh, that's what's needed, actually, uh, the missing link that's been in, in our transformations. So it's in that context that I meet these people, that they're, they're kind of, um, I would say, vulnerable to the message mm. that the biggest obstacle to transformation, um, uh, resistance to change is the umbrella, but the, you know, the biggest, maybe the most important uh, obstacle is actually that emotional feeling that people have to get past. Yep. Um, I talk about nostalgia, right? Nostalgia is that literal love of the past. Absolutely. And, and how can you get people to fall in love with the future? Mm. So the concept that I have been um, sharing, and I, in fact, I'm going to be sharing uh, tomorrow uh, in another session uh, that I'll be teaching, is about pre-nostalgia. 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 How can we get the, um, the leadership of the organization to serve up that 
glorious, even that glorious past, how can we link it to that even more glorious future? Um, so yeah. that we can fall in love with that future. So then rather than thinking of the future as something to be afraid of, because that's that's an emotion, mm -hmm. right? Again. Think of it as something to be excited about. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting you mentioned this. I've been doing a lot of work in digital transformation. And I, I got pulled in because a lot of the companies that I work with, they said, you know, uh, we're, we're asked to do a lot of digital transformation. We don't even know where to start. And it turns out that a couple of the things you said about, about you know, how, how companies react to, uh, to, to change, so the resistance to change, Resistance to change is the number one reason why companies fail to digitally transform. And yep. aligned with that is nostalgia. Uh, it's looking back at the past that feels that was, um, you know, essential for success. And digital transformation comes in and, and, and somehow invalidates that past. So one of my recommendations when I talk to, to, to CEOs and CTOs and CDOs is make sure that you validate the past in order to build for the future, because there's so much resistance to change when the past is disregarded. And once again, it comes to emotion. And, and uh, I'll ask you to react to this, but before I do, I remember somebody telling me, like, but you know, Professor, digital transformation is about technology. We didn't ask you here to come and talk about emotions. And they said, okay, I understand, but why do you think 80% of the companies who go through digital transformation fail? Is it because the software was not good enough? No, it's because people resist to change. Yeah, I, 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 so, so most of the journeys that I've been describing are exactly these digital, mm -hmm. right? In various industries, by the way. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's the same story. Yes, there is an issue of legacy systems that have to be yanked out and pulled in. But that feeling of almost enemy being at sea, we, we know how to do the past, but we don't know how to do the future. Yeah. So indeed, this is exactly uh, the story we say. And by the way, um, for um, com complacency is one of the byproducts of, of success yes, for of many course. of these organizations. And so grudgingly, you know, they're, another emotion, <laughs> right? Grudgingly, they're saying, OK, I guess we're going to have to yeah. make these changes. Um, and why, you know, the why for the change, because after all, they've been, they've been successful in the past. And, you know, that, that, that is the thing about the human animal is that the human animal doesn't just live its life, but it reflects on its life as it lives it. And so it tells stories and that that is part of the, uh, way in which leaders, have a way forward for connecting that mm -hmm. past to that even more glorious future. So anyway, my, my pre-nostalgia story um, is uh, in every deck of my digital transformations that I do, and I have several more scheduled for this year uh, that I'm in, involved in, the, the, that's, my, that's my punchline, essentially, is that your job is to connect that past to that even more glorious future. And if there is, uh, as you say, a kind of uh, denigration of the past. Yeah. Right? Some people think, you know, yeah. this, is, this is one of the legacies of the Silicon Valley, you know, way of doing things, which is move fast and break things. And the hell mm -hmm. with the people who don't want to, you know, move along, right? Um, and, you know, I don't, at least for the large companies, I don't think they have the luxury um, you know, of moving in, in, at, at that speed, right? And I think actually kind of impressive when you think about many of these companies, one of the inspiring stories uh, recently is look how we adapted to COVID. Who would have thought that, you know, given all the dinosaurs that you had in the organization in the past, <laughs> right? Uh, that somehow they figured out how to how to how to make this work, right? Yeah, it turns out that we can change. We just need a really, really massive motivator to change. Well, and and I think the the idea that as people, this is part of the great re uh, reassessment, right? People are reflecting. Yeah. Like, so what part of this was really essential? Exactly. And what part, and what part of this is not? Yeah. Right? 
And and what part of it this does it really justify the sacrifice? And and that that is a mental model shift as well, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, um, the and and this is where I I say that in a funny way, the companies that are most at risk are the ones who have been very successful in the past. In the past, yes. Right, because they they they're complacent. You know why change? Practice, yeah, they don't practice humility because there's there's too much confidence there that borderlines arrogance. It's like, well, we're doing very very well. We're doing very well. We're good with this. If you can get them to laugh at themselves, yeah, a little uh, bit. <laughs> which is an emotional uh, play, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Which is how look how silly we were in the past, right? Remember. I want to ask you a little bit more of a personal question, if if I may. So mm-hmm. um, I, I think of you as as one of the most um, we can call it emotionally sensitive or emotionally mature um, people that I know. Uh, when I see you teach, when I see you perform, I can I can see how you bring the audience with you. You use a lot of emotions when you teach, actually but you manage to captivate the audience. Your emotions are contagious. You can bring people up. You can also take them down. Within a second, you can change the entire emotion in the room. Uh, You're somebody who was an emotional mentor to me many times. I don't know if you ever knew that. Uh, But how did you become so emotionally mature or sensitive? Is this a skill that, that other people can learn or... So I'm a true. Uh, so first of all, thank you for the flattering description. Uh, again, I I would say I would advise you to check in with my wife, uh, who, who has seen. You know, I I don't know what settings you, you've seen me in, but she's seen me in one. So uh, there are there are times when I'm not. Um, I'm certainly I not living a up. Sample. Yes, yes, you have a bias sample. Yeah, so leave it at that. Um, so, so yes, I'm a true believer in development. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so let me answer this in two ways, uh, and I won't duck the question, okay? Uh, the first way is one of the really scary things for me about moving to Zoom to teach was exactly what you picked up on, which is the spontaneity of the live performance. Yes. Right? Um, and, you know, tomorrow I'm going to be teaching Zoom. Yep. And I'm going to explain that I'm, the, one of the things I do as I start is I say, so I am sitting in my office um, on my third floor, and I am staring at a green dot. The green dot is where the camera is. But what's very frustrating, of course, is that all of you are on this screen, screen over here. And if I and if I turn to look over there, you see the side of my face, mm-hmm. right? And I actually have a third screen, right, for something else, right? And so I will have the chat room, the chat window open. I will have the the participants. So I could see the hands open. I'll try and put it very close to the first screen. So if you see me slyly looking off to the right, it's because I'm trying to get your reactions, right? Yeah. But what I'm yearning for is eye contact, right? And so what ironically, this is the most frustrating thing, is to get eye contact or pseudo eye contact, you have I have to, to turn, turn away. away. Yes. I have to turn away, right? <laughs> Now, we all feel better when I put it out there out loud. Like, okay, right? It's like I'm paying attention that in, in order to, you know, if you're going to in, be involved in an educational experience, you should be connected. Yeah. Right? And so this was the thing that I found. Uh, I had to rope my way through to figure it out. One, my way often is humor. Right. Uh, I try and use humor. Everyone laughs when I say yes. They've all been there. Then I'm staring at the green dot. Okay. And then, oh, by the way, now it's okay when I turn this way. It's actually, you know, me attempting yeah. pseudo connection because I'm now reading faces in those in those postage stamps. Um, on the so on connection, the humor, connecting somehow. Well, both y- humor, humor um, is. It's also me being humble. 
Mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's about, look, there are limitations. Um, and, and I think, I think genuine sincerity that I'm trying. Yes. And believe it or not, that's, that's actually appreciated. Absolutely. We, we all, we're all, su we're all suffering with that. Now that's me, frankly, just putting myself in the position of when I'm on the zoom call and when people are presenting, what is the reaction I'm having? Mm. And I'm thinking, oh boy, I don't, I don't want to leave that reaction. Yeah. You know? um, because it's a, for me, it's a mortal sin for people to feel that they've been disrespected. Yeah. So, mm. so the idea that I'm trying very, you know, to right is, is, is I think appreciated. So this is my most recent um, example. Um, so happily, I'm now back in the classroom. And by the way, next week, I'll be teaching people from ASP. No, very excited about that. And I'm, I'm very excited. <laughs> in, in person. In, in person. Okay, they'll have masks on. Okay, but we, you know, this too, hopefully we will move past, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that connection, uh, right, is... Yes, very important. I think, as um, as setting a context where people are thinking, right? So what I learned long ago is that it doesn't matter what I say; it matters what's heard. And engagement is how you get people to hear. Yep. This is one of the reasons why I get frustrated when people have their phones and they're doing the, you know, the yep. uh, the iPhone prayer, right? <laughs> and, and they're and and they're um, you know they're on their computer and whatever, yep. right? So so engagement is for me the name of the game. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if I had to brand my approach, I'm a pull teacher, right? That is, it turns out it turns out you can put me on a podium and I can lecture. I'm pretty good at it, right? Lecturing, I can be clear, I can be organized, all of those things. Uh, it's not what I prefer to do. If I lecture, I actually ask permission at some with my EMBAs, for example, I'll say, okay, you need to suffer with me a 10 minute lecture mm -hmm. so that we can do the next phase. I do the okay. same. Okay, so the lecture is, um, you know, I, I it's it's a talent I think I can do, right? Frankly, it goes faster. Right? Yeah, it requires less. That is, the words come out of my mouth faster, yeah. but it's not clear they're being heard. Yeah, it's the difference right? between fast thinking and slow thinking, even for you. And so I realize, no. Slow it down. So I try and entice people with a puzzle, try and activate curiosity, right? And then out of that, I draw out of them the frameworks that I'm headed for. And that's my the same time. time. And the energy at the same time. Yeah. Okay. And and the and again, it's it's actually, you know, if people feel ownership of the ideas, mm -hmm. they'll see more value. Of course. Right? Rather than me, you know, rather than having the ideas happening to them, they're co-creating them, right? And so that's me trying to read. It, it, it's really just understanding, you know, when I've been engaged by incredible educators, right? What is it that I remember? And that's what I realize is that, and, and that, you know, that's the only thing I've become good at is to be able to say, if I were in this situation, so I do homework before every class, you know, before every group that I, I meet, yeah. I say, what, you know, where are they coming from? Hmm. Let me see how I can reach out to them. Mm -hmm. It guides the examples I use. Right. So when I'm dealing with financial services, I choose, I use some financial services examples. When I'm using heavy industry examples or mining or whatever, fine, I use examples. I, I have, luckily, on the shelf, many, 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 many examples where there are humans, often facing a digital transformation, by the way, across all these industries. Yeah. Right? All of them. So so that's my, you know, um, my uh, realization mm -hmm. 
right? One reassessment was, I remember when this first happened, I said, boy, is this going to tip me into retirement? <laughs> because, boy, the idea of staring at a screen and, you know, all of that. Okay. All right. So we survived that. I've discovered that, you know, the exigencies of teaching in Zoom have been such that actually you have to just forego some of the, some of my um, live performance in the same room, et cetera, right? Um, and uh, I'll say that I'm now at peace uh, at figuring out how to do it, right? But I am back in the classroom and I love the classroom. So I've gone on too long about this. No, you didn't. I said, I said I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not going to duck your question. Okay. So I think what I've learned, it's a learned response, right? I learned that this is how you reach people. Yeah. I was not born knowing this. In fact, quite the opposite. So my best friends from when I was young, they will describe me, if you meet them, as being paralytically shy. Really? And, you know, so when I hear, oh, but I'm an introvert, I can't do these things. I say, sorry, been there. Me too. Right? <laughs> um, and I realized that a lot of it had to do with my own feelings of lack of confidence and not being, you know, able to control things, etc. And I drew a breath. And I realized, you know, my first reaction when, when um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a good, like a good introvert. I'm, I'm a good scholar. Mm -hmm. I like to study things. I like to, right? I like to be in my head. Yep. And then I realized that, oh, but you pay the bills by teaching. Mm. Okay. And like most of the American public, I know this is where the, the study was done. Uh, most people think of uh, their, their worst fear is public speaking. It's more than death. Yeah. They, fear, they <laughs> fear public speaking more than death. I was, I was with them. I got it, right? But what I, and my first reaction was, oh, those students aren't really interested anyway. And so shields up, I protect myself by saying, well, I'm not, I'm not. And then I realized, you know what? I'm not being fair, right? And I, I was raised well. My parents, you know, let's be fair, right? Um, I had some amazing educators who invested time to be able to impart knowledge. Mm. I'm shortchanging those students. And what I realized is this is not about me, all about me. It's also about them. Yeah. So I put myself in their shoes and I said, when I've been inspired, what is it that I was, you're able to do, right? And I started to loosen up. Mm. And, and I realized that, boy, if you're going to be a college professor, you'd better get over this. And so over time, I've relaxed. And, and here's the secret, right? So that which you have picked up on when I'm in the classroom, where I'm emotionally involved with them, I... I'm actually managing my emotions. Of course. Um, and in fact, I probably have stage fright. I still get a little stage fright. Right. And so often I say, at least one person in this room is going to have fun today. <laughs> Everyone laughs. Ha ha ha. Right. And the reason I say that is to remind, I'm not talking to them only. I'm talking to me. Remember yep. to have fun. Yeah. Because fun and learning should not be opposites. Absolutely. Right? And fun and having this experience, right? That's that's my reminder to myself. So I play these little tricks on myself. Um, my wife will, I think, confess. Uh, and I don't, I don't think you'd have to uh, uh, really stress her very much to have her say that actually she knows that I'm fundamentally quite shy. Right. Uh, in, yeah. In new situations, I'm, I'm quite shy. On the other hand, um, I try uh, to I, I've learned to control those initial reactions and emotions. 
So this is a long way of saying, I've heard that a million times. Oh, I'm an introvert. All the stuff you're teaching about these uh, smart skills, right? Um, hmm, you know, not me, you know, isn't this something you're born with? And I basically say, sorry, I'm an introvert. I was paralytically shy as a child. Okay. A lot of this is development. Absolutely. No. I, uh, I, I, I share so many things with you in this, um, in this answer. I, uh, I was equally uh, just as shy. I remember fainting in public several times. And then I became an accidental professor, as, as you might know. And one of the things that I realized when I got in front of students for the first time, even before I, I, uh, I got my PhD, I was asked to do a talk to my students and to my colleagues. And I couldn't breathe. And then almost somebody took over me and said, you're going to have fun. You're going to have fun. And one thing that I learned is, and I know this is going to sound very immature, but I actually teach a lot for myself. Because I feel like emotions are contagious. If I'm very excited about what I teach, if I put a lot of interest in what I teach, if, like you said, instead of lecturing, I actually get close to you and I try to understand you and read your face and even through a mask, it always was better than just, you know, reciting something. So I'm very introvert. I did the MBTI test. I'm 98% introvert. Nobody would believe that when they see us in public. But like you said, this is not, introvertness is not an emotional immaturity. It's just the way people recharge energy. And I think the two of us here being both equally shy, if we manage to learn how to perform, because I think you are a performer in class. And I remember the first time teaching you and you took my breath away because I was like, this is so fun and it, obviously stimulating because otherwise if, if it's just fun, it's a stand-up comedy. But I was thinking, I, I could almost see, Roberto, how, how you manage the energy in the room. It's like you're a, you're a orchestra director and, and, and the musicians are the energy of people in the room and you can pull it in and you can pull it out and you can lift it and you can lower it and it's a magic. Well, again, you're being very, you're, you're making me uncomfortable with all the praise as a professor. No praise, validation. <laughs> it's okay. a smart well, thank skill. You. But thank it's you. also very inspiring. It was very, very inspiring for me. Uh, so so I, I probably also said, if we only have fun, then I haven't done my job. Exactly. Right. And that's what I said. It's not just fun. It's intellectually very stimulating because yeah. otherwise it would be a just stand-up comedy. Oh. Yeah, well, I, I'm, um, again, I, th these are my insights. Um, and with, I will say, I will say this, that it is an undervalued component in many of the organizations that I see, mm. right? You know, you and I are in the education business, so we, you know, we are um, trying and, and, you know, that part of the technology is getting ideas into people's heads. Yes. Right? That's our, that's our job, <laughs> right? And so, um, so it makes some sense that, um, sure, you know, we can recognize these performances in each other and th that's great. But I would say there's an, there's a component uh, for all leaders of being educators in exactly the way that we're talking about. Yes. Right. Um, and it doesn't mean that they have to be professors or to crack the same jokes or etc. But it does mean that connecting emotionally with people um, is the fast lane. Right. Now, this is all the light side of the force we've been talking about. But unfortunately, we're also familiar with the dark side of the force, right? Because that emotional basement can be polluted. And indeed, we have leaders who are manipulating, mm -hmm. um, using this material, as I say, for, for evil, not for good. Yep. Right? This, the same knowledge. That's the way science is. It can be used for, for good or for bad, right? Used properly. Um, it's helpful, used improperly, you know, like fire, it can burn down the house, right? Yep. So, so, so let's not, 
let's not be, um, you know, totally uh, naive about this. One of the reasons why I insist on developing a, uh, a, a class, which I will be teaching this week, actually, uh, is essentially about ethical considerations mm-hmm. as a leader, right? And how easy it is for people to talk themselves into uh, very bad places and how we can fall prey mm. to these very negative spirals, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, so forewarned is forearmed, right? When, you know, if, you, if you're in touch with that, you, you can see, you know, where, where you're being led. Um, and, you know, both ways, of course. Yeah, which is, again, another sign of, of emotional maturity or emotional sensitivity to, to recognize when emotions are used for, for the evil. And I think you, you said we have leaders, we have political leaders, we have organizational leaders that have this massive charisma, energy, you know, emotional, you know, appeal. Uh, but if, if it's not used for ethical purposes... It can it can bring more a lot more evil than 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 good. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to wrap it up here. Um, I think um, once again I learn every single time I have the opportunity to to talk to you. Um, when I thought about asking you about emotional maturity, I was torn because um, you're you're my teacher of developing multiple perspectives. But like I said, I wanted to ask you a thing that I wasn't that familiar with you, with your mindset, with your with your expertise. I loved very much what you said about the, the thinking fast and slow, but also feeling fast and slow. And I think that's something that we all need to do a lot more of. Any any final remarks before before we wrap this up um, in our conversation about the job is easy, the people are not? The only other um, reaction is that I was, I, I mentioned that I was raised well. I was raised to say please and to say thank you. So I want to say thank you. Uh, And I want to offer you the best of luck. Uh, Because as you know, I've been a big supporter of your enterprise. Um, And I I hope uh, in in concrete ways, but also emotionally, I feel some emotional investment in the journey that you've been on. And, you know, I've been to KL many times. Yeah. uh, Right. But uh, for all for all of what you're doing, thank you. Thank you. And best of luck. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. The extraordinary Roberto Fernandez. Mm-hmm.